Good morning, everyone. Before we begin the service today, and I appreciate you all uh, being here, please silence your cell phones or um, any mobile devices that you have, as people might not expect that you're in church at 10 o'clock on a Friday morning. Again, thank you very much for being here. As you are able, please stand for our opening hymn. resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is a friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, 
And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Charles. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth, until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His his mercies never come to an end. They are now every morning. Great is our faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says the soul, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 95 will be read in unison. Come, let us sing to the Lord. The second reading is from Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he, couldn't, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. <clears throat> For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Good morning, family and friends of Charles W. Rector. My name is Spencer Johnson, and I am a heretic. <laughs> Soon after coming to St. Margaret's in 2001, I met Charles and was soon introduced to a Sunday morning discussion group. The discussion group was intended to meet between 10 and 11, but often the, the discussions went well into the noon hour. Charles was the founder of the group that called themselves the Heretics. It was a group of about 20 or 30 people, one third of whom did not belong to St. Margaret's. They came from other churches, they came from other denominations, and some said they came from nowhere at all. But they came for this discussion group because it didn't exist in their parishes. It was called the heretics because there were no holes barred. You could say whatever you wanted. There was no doctrine or teaching that was not subject to questioning, dissection, and reassembly. We use the scriptures, Old Testament and New. We use books, like a book written by two Presbyterian ministers called If Grace Be True, then there really is no sin that isn't, un un that isn't pardonable or redeemable, and we used other materials. We had vivid discussions during which the members of the group poured out their thoughts, poured out their life experiences, and other things onto the table, into the mix on Sunday morning. We explored other religions 
Islam by reading the Quran, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucius, and we discovered that in, in exploring other religions that there were more similarities with our own than there were differences. True Charles was, Charles was our guide and our mentor and really the source of a lot of information, but he was never, ever overbearing. He never, ever, ever gave us a lecture. He was a great listener, and he was able to uh, kind of bring it all together. As an example, it took us about three weeks, but we shredded the Nicene Creed. And having done that, we put it back together in terms that we thought were more, more meaningful to us in our present day lives. I will close by telling a short story. I think the heretics reached a crescendo when Bishop Eelhoff, who was the Bishop of Maryland, came for his annual visit to St. Margaret's. And he stood right here on this altar in his resplendent vest vestments and his mitre. And he waved the bulletin. And he said, I want more copies of this. He said, in the announcements, it says that in order to allow full attendance at my town hall meeting and my 1115 service, the heretics will not meet today. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's a, that's a sign of real progress. <laughs> but I will say, thank you, Charles, for sharing your time, your intellect, your interests, and your compassion with all of us. And although you have seen your second epiphany, you are not really gone because you live on in all of us that you touched, and we are grateful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ernie Tucker, a Charles' good friend uh, for many years with, through the Heretics, certainly. Uh, I was also, I overlapped with him two years uh, teaching at the Naval Academy. I began in 1990. He retired, I think, in the early 90s, somewhere in there. Uh, but we didn't really know each other until I joined the Heretics in the fall of 2000, right around the time Spencer did, and just found it to be an incredible uh, welcoming place. I, I guess I, I really wanted to just think about Charles. Uh, there's so many dimensions to Charles, to your father. He's an incredible man. Uh, and just think about um, four of his most significant characteristics and how I witnessed them. Uh, one was his inquisitiveness. He was just fantastically inquisitive. And I guess the bond that I had with him there, he was a graduate of the University of Chicago the undergraduate great books program. And there's a great photograph of him, I think with uh, one of the great books people, maybe Mortimer J. Adler or somebody like that. But the point is, uh, Charles throughout his life was a great books man. And, uh, and I kind of I really felt welcomed to that because I, I love the great books as all of us do too. And Charles was an incredible force with that. Uh, in fact, that leads to the next thing I wanted to say is how generous he was. He was incredibly generous in sharing his time, in sharing insights, in sharing books. Incredibly generous person. And a just uh, an incredible generosity to all of his friends and family. And a, just an amazing thing. Um, and I think that uh, loyalty is another thing that Charles had. Charles was deeply loyal to the Naval Academy. 
and he would come to events that I sponsored there. I know that he has strong connections still to uh, many of uh, retired faculty there and people and students that he taught, so enormous loyalty. Finally, the last quality I want to mention is his determination. He was a determined, when he wanted to do something, he would do it. He came and visited me in Istanbul in 2006 when my wife Sarah and I were there on a Fulbright, and we just had a fantastic time. He was determined to see every aspect of the city of Istanbul, which, you know, given like a 15-year period, you might be able to do. He tried to, to put it into about a two-and-a-half-week period, so he did it. And the highlight of all that was that uh, he had always wanted to meet this guy, John Freely, who was one of the great writers and raconteurs about Istanbul. John Freely, interestingly enough, was born in 1926, and he also was a physicist. So Charles said, and Charles said, hey, we got to meet John Freely. And I was like, okay, I got to get out the, the Rolodex and see who. So we found John Freely, and we had this fantastic uh, tea and baklava with John Freely in Istanbul. Uh, absolutely one of the great moments of my life. And enjoying that incredible uh, city with, with, with Charles was an, another incredibly beautiful time for me. Uh, I will miss Charles immensely, but I, I feel, as, as Spencer said, that the connection goes on, continues, and his, his memory will be shining and blessed forever. Thank you. Morning. My name is Jim Hall. I'm a member of the Monday night Bible study, and so are the two previous speakers. Uh, what do you think special about a, an old man's Bible study? The Monday night Bible study was formed in 1987 from a group from St. Anne's in Annapolis and Charles Rector. Charles became a member late, later after it was formed, but the group had several key purposes. To study scripture along with developing a spiritual camaraderie. To develop your personal theology. To study scripture, but not just in the Bible, but with a, a variety of Bible commentaries and other reference material. The unwritten requirement for the group was to do your homework. Come prepared to participate in group discussion with substance. Charles hosted the group at his home in Annapolis. He not only hosted, but he also provided other sources of rep reference material for scripture discussions with his extensive library. The makeup of the group is, I think, important. There were those who, with liberal interpretation of scripture, others with strict interpretation of the scripture, and others that were in the middle or still searching. The group varied with backgrounds rating, uh, ranging from United States Naval Academy graduates, physics PhDs, engineers, historians, both Navy and, and Army veterans, uh, academics, bankers, psychologists, and a range of, of, of uh, backgrounds. Charles was a physicist, and he provided the group a bridge between physical science and the scripture. He argued that creation didn't happen by chance or by accident. And by gosh, he could prove it. It was a divine, a di the result of a divine being. A higher power was responsible. And Charles <laughs> was very effective in disputing the by chance theories. Charles was very comfortable with his God. He was a, a fan of Richard Hooker. Now, Richard Hooker is an English theologian in the uh, 1600s. He put forth his three-legged stool representing his approach to scripture. Scripture, 
tradition, and reason. And I want to take this opportunity to add another leg uh, of physical science that Charles represented. Charles was a teacher at heart, and amidst liberals and conservatives, and sometimes extreme liberals and extreme uh, conservatives, he often, he most of the time served as a mentor, not by using an argument, but occasionally by providing a reference from his library that made the point somewhere in the middle of the debate. Often our discussion led to reading and the discussion of books by such authors like Bishop Spong, and who wrote Unbelievable, The Fourth Gospel, and other groups, other, other books uh, that had an interesting name or title like Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus, or No God But God, and the capitalization is important there. Some of our best discussions were based on disagreements with, the, with these authors, and some agreements. And while our meetings were hosted by Charles at, at his house during the last four years, or three and a half years, we resorted to, uh, the, the old man resorted to something to bring us into the 21st century by using Zoom. So in the last few years, all, all it had been Zoom. I'm going to miss Charles. I'm going to miss him for a number of reasons, but one of them I'll share with you because he often did it when he was uh, attended St. Margaret's. He was so eloquent in reading scripture out loud. He put his heart into it. He would got to a point in, our la in the last few months where he didn't participate actively in a discussion but he would read the closing prayer, and I love that. So thank you, Charles. We'll miss you. Please stand as you are able. And in assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our brother Charles, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Charles and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raised the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother Charles, 
who was reborn by water and the spirit and holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Please be seated. Thank you all so much for being here today to celebrate uh, Charles's life, to remember him, and to share hospitality and uh, fellowship with one another. Um, I want to thank especially Margaret Kai Ziegler, who is a faithful member of the Heretics for the Flowers today. Uh, she came to me on Sunday and said, please let me do the flowers for Charles. And that's the depth of the love that a lot of people in our community have for your father and for what he meant to a lot of us. Certainly, um, I can remember the first time I think I met Charles was even before Heretics, but it was on a Sunday morning when he would get up to read at the 1115 service. And um, I was nervous about there being so many people in a church. I came from a small church, and I wasn't sure how Charles's voice was going to carry especially when he chose not to stand behind the microphone and the lectern. Rather, he stood right here and proclaimed the reading. Um, I, was moved, I was moved to tears because I'd never seen somebody uh, really you know, internalize the reading and then offer it to other people so freely. And Charles had that gift, the gift of internalizing the grace of God the gifts that God gave him, and then turning around and offering them to others in such a generous and gracious fashion. And if we take nothing else from today, I hope that you take that spirit from, you, uh, from here, the gift of um, graciousness, generosity, and giving uh, to other people. So uh, with that in mind, we are going to go to communion now. And at St. Margaret's Church, we believe that this altar isn't so much uh, an Episcopal altar or our altar. It's really God's table. So all of you, no matter what denomination you call your own, where you are in your spiritual journey, uh, your faith denomination, who you love, where you work, what you wear, none of that matters to God. What matters is that you are a unit of God's grace, unprecedented, irreplaceable, and irrepeatable. So please come for communion. If you don't want to receive, you can just cross your arms over your chest and we'll give you a blessing. Either way, we're thrilled that you're here. We hope that you will... Join us for the reception following in the parish hall. Uh, we're also going to process down to the graveside and uh, bury Charles there. If you'd like to join us for that, we will process out of the church. You can just follow that procession. If you don't wish to come to the graveside, that's fine. We will see you in the parish hall following. Either way, we're so grateful that you're here. I want to thank the Rector family for allowing us to do this service here. Uh, it means a lot to us to be able to say goodbye to Charles in this way. Thank you very much.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine gave thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of praise, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob, Leah, and Rachel, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes and see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ lived and died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
thanksgiving, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love, you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort in affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Charles. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the chief, through the blood of eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Everyone is welcome to join the family at the gravesite.